of the DNA technologies that have proven critical in our new age of molecular genetics, the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is among the most significant. The PCR technique provides a way to selectively amplify a specific region of interest in the genome, making it available for any number of further analyses. To understand PCR, it is important to first review the basics of DNA replication. Remember that DNA exists as a double helix, with the base pairs protected on the inside of this structure. In order for the sequence to be read and replicated, it must first be unwound. This unwinding is accomplished in vivo by the enzyme DNA helicase. Once access to the base sequence is established, DNA polymerase, another enzyme, binds the DNA and begins to build a new strand by adding nucleotides according to base pairing rules, A to T and G to C. DNA polymerase is a powerful enzyme, but it does have limitations. Specifically, it can only add nucleotides to the hydroxyl group at the 3' prime end of a DNA sequence. Therefore, progression proceeds uninterrupted on the leading strand, but must be accomplished in multiple short fragments on the lagging strand. Furthermore, it means the DNA polymerase cannot begin DNA synthesis from scratch, but instead requires a short primer, a sequence that serves as a starting point for replication. Once a primer has bound the DNA, DNA polymerase can begin to build the replicated sequence by extending off the primer's 3' prime end. Finally, DNA ligase must be used to link together the multiple shorter DNA fragments on the ligand strand. Each of these steps for in vivo DNA replication will also be important for understanding the in vitro PCR reaction. Before initiating the PCR reaction, a scientist must first select a region of interest in the genome. This region may be a gene or a portion of a gene. Still prior to reaction initiation, the scientist must design primers that will allow him to selectively replicate that region. For this specific region, a scientist might design primers that look like this. Now we are ready to set up the reaction. A scientist must include in the reaction tube a sample of the DNA from which he hopes to amplify the region of interest. Furthermore, he must also include the primers he has designed to do so. He will also need to include plenty of spare nucleotides, the building blocks for DNA construction, and DNA polymerase, which will do that construction. You may be wondering about why we don't include DNA helicase. The answer to this question lies in the reaction protocol. In PCR, we use heat to denature and separate the DNA. Therefore, the first stage of PCR involves a major increase in temperature. This increase causes the DNA to denature and separate. Once the DNA has separated, the temperature must be decreased again to promote the binding of our primers to the DNA sequence. Once they have been given an opportunity to bind, we will increase the temperature again to accommodate the activity of our DNA polymerase, which replicates all the DNA downstream of our primers. In PCR, a special type of DNA polymerase is used that can withstand the temperature increase required for DNA denaturing without itself denaturing. After the first round of DNA replication, we repeat. First, we denature. Then, we bind primers. And finally, we replicate the DNA downstream of the primers. At this point, after just two rounds of PCR, it's pretty easy to count that we have eight or two to the third copies. If we repeat the process again, we will end up with 16 copies.
or two to the fourth. Importantly, among these 16 copies, we will have also obtained two double-stranded fragments of DNA that contain only the region of interest. These two fragments account for four out of 16 total copies of the region of interest, and therefore account for 25% of the total DNA at this stage. After just one more round of PCR, we will now have 32 copies of the region of interest, including eight double-stranded fragments with only the region of interest. These eight fragments represent 16 out of 32 total copies of our region of interest, and therefore account for 50% of the total DNA at this stage. As this graph indicates, with each successive round of PCR, the percentage of DNA containing only the region of interest climbs until it approaches 100%. This selective amplification is an important aspect of the PCR process. Now let's consider another important graph. If you were to graph the number of copies that we obtain as a function of the number of rounds of PCR we perform, you would obtain an exponential curve. PCR leads to the exponential amplification of the region of interest. After just 25 rounds, we will have over 33 million copies of our region. Hopefully based on the information provided in this video, you now understand both the technique and the theory of the polymerase chain reaction, an important foundation in modern molecular biology.